Welcome to the All of Christ for All of Life podcast, where we equip men and women to be faithful in every aspect of life. This week, you will hear Nancy Wilson's talk, Vocational Homemaking and Respect, from our audio collection titled, Reforming Marriage Conference. Thank you all for coming. It's great to be with you all. It's a lot of familiar faces, a little reunion in some ways of people we've uh, known in Moscow or have met other parts of the country, but thank you so much for coming. Let's open with a word of prayer, shall we? Father, please use this time now as we come together to talk about our responsibilities and duties as wives. I pray you would encourage us and bless us from your word and give us grace. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I'm going to be talking to you about vocational domesticity or vocational homemaking, it says, and respect. These things are, of course, all connected, and I hope after listening to my husband the last hour and, and thinking about the responsibility our husbands have to assume responsibility for everything, my response whenever I hear this, and like he said, it's food, and I've heard him say it many times, and I don't tire of hearing it, but it stirs up in me uh, fear, really, of just to make his job a blessing that I know, of course, I'm responsible to God for my sins, but that what I do in our home, he's responsible for God for all of it. And so we want to think about our duties as wives, how to make their jobs just a joy and a delight and a blessing and a privilege to them and um, to make it easy, in a sense, for them to do what God has called them to do and not to make it difficult. Um, it's difficult enough as it is, and we're all sinners. And so everything I'm going to be talking about today, of course, in order to be good wives, we have to be good Christians. You can't just be a good wife apart from the grace of Christ. I know you know that, but I have to say that. Don't forget that this is a life of faith. We walk by faith. We don't just look at his commands and try to apply them woodenly, that we have to trust God in it and for it and day by day walking by grace and being quick to confess our sins, quick to extend forgiveness, uh, quick to be obedient, eager to please God. If we're not that kind of women to begin with, of course we can't, we can't have the kind of home that we're shooting for here. So we have to first of all love God above all else, be submissive to Christ, be the kind of women who want to please him first. And then secondly, uh, it's one of the subsets of that, of course, to be obedient and uh, contented, joyful wives in our homes. So I talk about vo vocational homemaking or domesticity. Of course, this is what we're called to. And, but we're also called to respect. We're called to respect our husbands. So I want to start by just defining that a little bit. Um, you know the verses, probably. In Ephesians 5, it speaks to wives being submissive. Submit yourselves unto your own husbands, in verse 22. And in verse 33, let the wife see that she respects or reverences her husband. And I just, one of the things I appreciate about all the references to submission and um, respect, also in Colossians and 1 Peter, we're told to be submissive. But in all of these, it says, to your own husbands your own husbands and submit yourselves or see to it. Let the wife see that she's doing this. This is not something your husband should have to impose on you. It's something that you should be seeing that you're doing. And he shouldn't have to be telling you like, well, you're not respecting me or you're not being submissive. He may have to say that, but you're to the commandments to you. Submit yourselves to your own husbands. Let the wife see that she respects her husband. Submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Be submissive to your own husbands. That's the way it's, it's worded, to your own husbands. It's not wives or women be submissive to men. No, it's wives be submissive to your own husbands. God has given you a husband. It's your own husband. It's just one. And it's your duty to see that you are being respectful and submissive to him. We're to do this, like I said, it's all of faith. It's all of grace. Uh, Christ enables us to do this. And we look at the husbands are commanded to love their wives, 
the way Christ loves the church, we're to be, the, what kind of church uh, do we want to imitate? And you look around, I, I see sometimes it's discouraging because we see the church being unfaithful and unsubmissive to God. Um, but, but we have to set our sights um, to God's word and say, I want to be a good picture of the church, a submissive wife, not um, dividing, not leaving my husband, not turning away from uh, God's word. So all of this should stir up a, a holy fear in us. And Lord, by the grace of God, this is what I want to do. This is what the kind of woman I want to be. Help me. Um, God picks us up where we are, not where we should have been. He's so gracious. And so as we talk about these things today, if you have things you have to put right, and I'm sure um, some things may come to mind as we're talking about this, just be quick to do it. Be quick to do it. Don't put it off, and don't beat yourself up. But say, by the grace of God, this is where I am. He will pick me up and take me the rest of the way. We walk by faith from beginning to end. And he'll never leave us or forsake us. That's the bottom line. And so don't be, um, don't think it's too late. I've, I've messed up too much or God can't fix this or I can never be this kind of a, a wife. No, no. That's hopelessness. That's despair. We have a Savior. So uh, look to the Savior as we talk about these things. Now, we're called to be respectful. I, I defined respect um, it's not original with me. I just look it up in the dictionary. What is respect anyway? Women are not naturally very good at it. I don't think it comes to us easily. We have to learn. We have to look it up in the dictionary. I think uh, we have to practice this. And it really is brotherly kindness, charity. It's really just Christian virtues, courtesy, treating our husbands with courtesy, with honor, uh, deferring deference. And of course, it has to be just like the love has to be incarnational. The husbands have to love their wives. It has to have hands and feet on it. They can't just feel it. We can't just say, oh, I do respect him. But we have to, it has to be incarnational in the way we live, the way we talk to them and about them. And I want to spend some time going through some Proverbs and and gleaning from what Proverbs has to say to us about the foolish woman and the wise woman and how that relates to our calling for uh, homemaking and respect. But it is um, our respect or disrespect is communicated a thousand ways in the way we um, live with our husbands. Much of it comes out of our mouth. It's the way we talk to them. But it has to be by seeking their counsel, by taking it very seriously, by uh, being considerate of their needs. Sometimes when you have a lot of kids, you start treating your husband like one of the kids. It's like, oh no. <laughs> one time I was uh, wiping noses. You know, you're going from one to the other. And um, we were over at Doug's parents' home, and uh, his father was sitting there. And, you know, I started to go there. And <laughs> he said, once a mother, always a mother, you know. but. That was just a mistake. But we're not to treat our husbands like they're one of the kids. And even though we are to be despots, as Doug put it, in our homes, as far as the way we manage and run our home, we don't hand them a list of things when they come in the door either. And did you wipe your feet? And did you, you know, uh, and chase them around like we do the children? No. We're to treat them with real deference and to, to show our children what it looks like, that they know how to respect dad because they see mom doing it all the time, and that our daughters see, this is the kind of man I want because mom respects dad like this. I need to do that. So it has to be the right sort of man to marry in order to render that kind of respect. And our sons see it also as this is the kind of woman I hope to marry, is someone like mom who will respect me. So it's very important that we model these things um, to our kids. As we go through Proverbs and just look at a few verses about women, it's pretty, can be pretty rough on us. Some of them probably come to mind right off. And I'm going to hit them. Um, but it's funny, Proverbs is pretty repetitive, some of these areas. And the reason is because it's so important. And God is teaching. You know, Proverbs is written um, for young men. Uh, most of it is a 
is my son, you know, listen, my son, my son, it's a mother and a father teaching um, chapter 31 is the words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. Okay, so it's mother's instruction to a son about the kind of woman to look for, but it's all for our instruction, right? It's all for our instruction and our edification. And when something's repeated, that means this is an important point. Really pay attention to this. Well, we have to start with uh, Proverbs 31, verse 10. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. And then the rest of the chapter goes on to describe some of this. It's wonderful. This is verse 10, 11, and 12. Who can find a virtuous woman? This implies it's not easy. <coughs> not easy to find a virtuous woman. And virtue is a word you don't even hear very much today. It's not a very uh, popular word today. We want to be virtuous, godly women. And virtue implies godliness, of course. The old, archaic form of the, of the word really implied a masculine courage, uh, which I found really interesting and encouraging that women need courage to fulfill our duties. We really do. We need real courage on many levels. And that's not the, the modern definition of virtue, but that's where it came from, was this idea of a, of a masculine courage. And we sometimes think, well, the men need courage, and the women need other things. And we all need courage. And you may need courage right now just to face some of the things that you're up against. Well, look to Christ for that. Who can find a virtuous woman? They're not, uh, they're not uh, a dime a dozen. They're like rubies, far above rubies, rare. And this kind of woman, her husband never has to worry about whether she's going to do him good or ill. He safely trusts her. So he has some translations say no lack of gain, or he has no need of spoil. He doesn't need spoil. He has got a woman who is just bringing him good, just bringing him good all the time. She will um, do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Don't we want to have that said about us? Uh, that our husbands can say, you know, she has done me good and not evil all her life. When we die at a ripe old age, to have that sort of testimony. This is what we are shooting for. And, of course, uh, respect is a big part of this. Because when we're respecting our husbands, we're bringing them good. It's like we're just hauling in the treasures. We're just hauling it in when we're respecting them. Husbands are built, I guess this is the way God made the world. Um, they need respect, just like we need love. We need love and security, and that's why God commands husbands, love your wives. Pour it on, unconditional. Men are built to need respect. That's why from the time they're little, you know, your, uh, your sons, remember your brothers when they were little, you know, doing things to attract attention, um, standing on their head so all the girls will ooh and ah or coming in with, you know, blood um, from some courageous deed, no doubt, <laughs> falling off the slide or whatever. You know, they want to be respected. And so they do silly things sometimes to get respect because that's what they want. That's sort of the gas they run on. That's the fuel. That's the food they need. And so wives are set apart by God to be one of those main instruments of bringing respect to them. Now, they want respect in their job. They want respect in other places, but they really need it in their homes. It's the way God made them. We need to learn to be respectful toward our sons, not submissive in the same way, but as they're growing up, to respect them, that they're used to being treated with courtesy and honor. I can remember telling my daughters, you know, you don't talk. Um, that way to your brother. And of course, he couldn't talk in an unloving way about them either. It wasn't a one-way street. But uh, you don't share things like that with your friends about your brother. You will never say that. You know, we, I want you to respect him. I was teaching him to love his sister. So it's, it, this applies in so many areas. Now, in Proverbs, we have um, illustration many illustrations of the woman who um, is either going to be man's greatest, sweetest blessing or um, greatest curse. Okay? 
woman is the source of one or the other. It's either going to be a bond of misery or a sacred union. This is from, um, now I'm going to forget his name, but it'll come to me later. It's a um, commentary from the last century, and I'll try and remember his name. He says that marriage or a woman is either going to be the greatest curse or the sweetest blessing. And I know you want to be the sweetest blessing, where you're, someone says to your husband, what's the sweetest, greatest blessing in your life? Obviously, apart from, from your salvation in Christ, you say, oh, my wife. Or what's the biggest pain in your life? Many men would say, my wife, right? Let's look at some of these verses. Um, this, these are all going to be from Proverbs 9.13. A foolish woman is clamorous. She's simple and knoweth nothing. 11.22, as a jewel of gold and a swine snout, so is a fair woman which is without discretion. And then I'm going to read one more, and then I'm just going to go back and talk about these things. 12.4, a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in his bones. All right, the first one, a foolish woman's clamorous. She's noisy. She doesn't know anything. She's talking a lot. She's making a lot of uh, uh, clamor, she, but she's ignorant. She's ignorant and self-indulgent. This woman with um, a beautiful woman, a fair woman, who doesn't have discretion, is not discreet. She's like a jewel, something beautiful, stuck in a pig snout, which is, you know, we're so used to that image, but it is a really funny picture. And of course, we don't want to be like a swine snout with a jewel stuck in it. How ridiculous. But without discretion, this is the kind of woman who is bad-mouthing, perhaps. She's not discreet about what she shares at the prayer meeting or the Bible study or just over coffee with her friends or whatever. She, um, she's not dis she doesn't have discretion, so she's oversharing. Oversharing things that her husband probably wouldn't appreciate, disrespecting him. All of our husbands are sinners. They all have failures. They all uh, flub up, but we don't need to tell everyone about it. Just flip it. Think about some of the things you've told your friends. How would you feel if your husband had shared some of these things um, with his friends? And you know what happens? You tell the ladies the stupid thing he did or the way he hurt you or the way he made you feel stupid, or whatever it was. And then they, who do they tell? They tell all their husbands right away, don't they? Do you know what so-and-so did? And it's amazing how the word gets around. And then all these people, when they see your husband, they see, oh, he's the guy that did that stupid thing. Occasionally, I've heard something, and I thought, you know, I wish she hadn't told me that. Because now when I see him, I always think of that idiotic thing he did, and I have to overcome that. I think, you know, he is, she, she was out of line in telling me that. And I, I'm going to put it out of my mind. One of the reasons why we're careful, and I hope you won't think this is too hard or harsh, but in ladies' Bible studies at home, I rarely, I mean, do not open it up for prayer. I don't. Because I know what will happen. And it's not that I don't want to pray for everybody. Of course, we need to be praying for one another. And we all know some of the big prayer requests that are going on that are obvious public ones, either illness or troubles that are public. We can pray for one another. But women tend to overshare. And it's, you know, once you've said it, it's very hard, isn't it, to get it back. You can call everybody in the Bible study and say, you know what I said about my husband? That was disrespectful. Please forgive me. You know, and you do that, which I highly recommend. Okay, if you have overshared with your mom, your sister, your good friend, um, the Bible study, I really suggest you go back and say, please forgive me, that was, that was inappropriate. That was disrespectful to my husband. I didn't need to share that with you all. Now, of course, if your husband is, uh, let's say he, you find out he's got a pornography problem and you talk to him about it, and he's not going to do anything about it. You need to call the pastor. You need to, you need to talk to an elder. I'm not saying don't ever share in trouble. If your husband has hit you, of course, um, you, need to get, you need to get help. You may need to call the cops. I mean, but I, that's not usually what we're talking about. 
I want to throw that in there just so you know I'm not saying husbands don't have absolute authority. Only God has absolute authority. And uh, parents don't have absolute authority over their children. Mothers don't have absolute authority over their children. It's, uh, and, and husbands do not have absolute authority. If they are requiring something of you that is ungodly, you have recourse. If you're members of a church, then you can, you can go to your pastor, your elders, and they can, um, they can discipline him. And like I said, in some cases, if it's bad enough, you may need to call the cops. I've had women tell me things. I say, why didn't you tell my husband when you were in his office? She said, oh, you know, I just couldn't do it. Or they would think, well, I thought that would be disrespectful. And, and I say, no, that is actually a form of respect, holding him accountable. If he is doing something sinful or not, and I, by sinful, I'm not saying um, he didn't thank you for breakfast or he got annoyed at the traffic. I'm not talking about calling the, the cops or the pastor or that kind of thing. I'm talking about grave sin. But oversharing, I wrote an article a long time ago. I think it's in um, The Fruit of Our Hands. But it's when we share too much about our family. It's like our slip showing. You know, it's just not what we wanted everybody to see. And um, you may share things about your children. I think it's just unkind. Did everybody need to know that Johnny's still wetting the bed? Or that, um, you know, your your daughter is... um, struggling in school or, you know, do you need to share all these things? You know, there's a certain amount of loyalty we should have to our family to protect them. And if you're going to talk to the teacher because your daughter's struggling with a class, well, that's different. That's talking to someone who can help the problem. But if you're just telling your friends about it, um, it's not productive. Try to limit who you talk to, to people who are either part of the problem or part of the solution. You may say, well, all my friends are part of the solution because they'll encourage me. Um, Well, I doubt it. Sometimes you feel better for the venting, but they're not able, they're not able to hold your husband accountable. And, but they may, I mean, I, I have tried to make it a practice. If someone tells me something about their husband, then I will tell them what to do say, well, you should do this. And one time a lady was just sharing. So when I went to do that, she said, I don't want to hear it. I already know all that. I said, well, then do not tell me. Do not tell me about it. Because there's no reason for me to just hear it. And we, we kid ourselves into thinking, well, this makes me just feel better that eight of my friends know that my husband's a jerk and that I'm having this trouble. He's like, no. Let's be wise and discreet. I'm not saying we pretend he doesn't have any faults, but we use discretion and we pray about who to go to. If you need help and encouragement, there may be a a woman in your church that can give you counsel. I'm all for that. And sometimes, depending on the problem, you may need to ask your husband's permission. Say, honey, do you mind if I talk to so-and-so? But you should go with the attitude of not just venting all your husband's problems, but getting help for you. What are my duties in this? What is my duty um, in living with a man who's an unbeliever, for instance? Say you are married to an unbeliever or a Christian who's acting like an unbeliever. So you go and say, what does scripture have for me? And, And your friend or counselor can say, well, you're to win him without a word by your chaste, reverent behavior. So let's talk about how you can be chaste and reverent. Talk about your problems, because you can fix that instead of just talking about his. A virtuous woman is a crown. It's a crown. You know, this uh, wife is her husband's glory. That's what a crown is. It's glory. It's hard to understand sometimes. I don't always feel like a glory. But that's what we are. That's what God's designed us to be. Or the opposite is rottenness in his bones, putting him to public shame, like a cancer eating away at his bones. Those are our options. You see how potent our behavior is. It has great impact. It's either going to be like a disease, incurable disease, that's rotting him away from the inside out, or it's going to be a crown, a glory, that our, our behavior will be. A crown to him. Virtuous woman is a crown. And then, of course, 14.1, every wise woman buildeth her house, but the foolish 
pluck it down with her own hands. Be bad enough if an enemy did it. Be bad enough if some outsider came in and tore up your house. But I've seen women tear up their own, just like they were actually had the sledgehammer and were just going at it, ripping it up. And of course, all sin is destructive. But there's some sin that women can commit in their own ha in their own homes that just tears it down, it destroys. We want to be building, edifying, constructing, not tearing down. But those are our options. So often women don't see the potency of what we're called to do. We think, oh, I don't know. I don't feel like I'm really doing anything at home. I should find something else to do. So don't you see? If you're wise, you're building. You're in the middle of a construction project that goes on for a long time. You're building something beautiful. Don't abandon it. And don't tear it down. We're either a source of blessing or curse. Um, a foolish son is the calamity of his father, and the contentions of a wife are a continual dropping. Drip, 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 the leaky faucet. A foolish son is a calamity. It's terrible for a father. Contentions of a wife are a continual dropping. Here it is. It's Charles Bridges. That's who it is. It's just, a, it's just called Commentary on Proverbs. This is what he says. Many are the miseries of a man's life, but none like that which cometh from one who should be the stay of his life. He says, there's no lawful escape. He said, at least a foolish son, you can kick him out of the house. He says, but a wife must be endured. It's a domestic calamity. Isn't that sad? Um, do you know, can you think of examples in your mind of this? Yeah, we can all think of it, where it's a domestic calamity, where the house, uh, it's just been torn to pieces. Now, like Doug said, the husband's responsible for this. He's responsible, and he has to, before God, you know, confess his own sins in it. But I'm not talking to husbands. I'm just talking to you all. So we're, not, we're going to leave their duties aside because Doug is letting them have it about that. <laughs> but remember, respect is not about you. It's not about, um, excuse me, I got the backwards. Respect is not about him. It's about you. It's not about him. Well, women will say to me, but, but he's not respectable. Or I don't respect him. So you know what? It's about you being respectful. It's not about him whether he is respectable. But I'm telling you that just like love bestows loveliness, you know, you see a woman who's just been loved for years and years. She's lovely. She's radiant because she's been loved. Just like little children, when we love them, they're secure, they're happy, and it's, uh, it comes from the inside out. Same way, a husband who's respected becomes more and more respectable. It's really true. It's really true. So you say, well, I can't think of anything about him that's respectful. Usually you can think of something. And I'll say, you know, you did marry him. Why? Why did you marry him? There must have been something that you admired about him. Um, and maybe you need to go back and think about what are those things. Make a list of all the things you really do respect about your husband and focus on those things. Women tend to look at the other side of the paper, the things he, they don't respect him in, and often it's spiritual leadership. He's not doing it the way I thought he would, right? He's not leading me the way I think he should. And discontentment sets in, and then we just focus on the negative things. If only, if only, if only. Instead of thinking, you know, there's so much I have to be grateful for with this man. So much. And often, you know, there's things you may not have thought about that you appreciate about them. One time on our way to church, I said, Honey, thanks for taking us to church. Every week, he just gets us to church. And he looked at me like, <laughs> It is my job. <laughs> but how many husbands just don't? Just don't. The wife has to go. I can think of women I've known that the wife faithfully just took the kids and went to church by herself for years. Now her husband comes. Um, sometimes it's a negative example that makes you think, oh, honey, thank you for never deserting me. Thank you for working hard all these years and bringing home a paycheck and providing for us. You know, thank you for um, being kind to my parents. Thank you for, you know, just on and on. You think about it. Thank you for reading the Bible at the dinner table. 
Maybe he doesn't get you all up at five for family devotions, like one of your friend's husbands. But you have to be willing to accept his style of leadership. And his style may be different than, than your friend's. And you may envy your friends and think, that's what real godliness looks like. We just get you know, a few verses at dinner. Um, I've had women ask me, well, should I read the Bible to the children if my husband isn't? I say, well, are you with them all day? Uh, of course, read the Bible to them. It's not like scripture says, and mothers, don't open the word. <laughs> only, only dad can do that. No, no, no. It's better to dwell in a corner of a housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. 21.9. 21.19. It is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and angry woman. 27.15 and 16. A continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. See the repetition here? It's like he's trying to get something to us. You know that God said... It's not good that man is alone. It's not good. That's why he created Eve. It's not good. But then look what God's word says. And this is God's word too. It's better to dwell in a corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a big, gorgeous home. Better to just go live in the garage. It's better to be out in the wilderness. You know, just out a homeless person. It's rather be homeless than in a, in a home with this contentious and angry woman. Now, contentiousness and brawling and angry and then this continual dropping and contentiousness, these are all um, describing a woman who is critical, disputatious, always has to argue, never satisfied. Why can't you do it like this? And even if she doesn't say it, he can read it. He can read it that she's not pleased. She's never happy. He can never do it in a way that pleases her. It's always a little short. Paycheck is always not quite enough. Um, he's just not meeting her needs the way she was dreaming. Um, and he says, solitary life is better. It's good for man to be alone than to be with a woman in this situation. It's raining inside and out. So you may as well just go out and be out in the rain out there. Rather be exposed to the elements than in a house where it's pouring rain. What happens is all the things God creates to be comforts turn into contentious places, like the dinner table, which should be, it shouldn't that just be a, the center of joy and, and um, happiness in the home? Dinner table turns into an eh. You know, and you're on the kids and complaining to the husband or giving him the look or the cold treatment or whatever it is. The marriage bed, which should be a place of rejoicing, becomes a place of um, um, coldness, a rejection. Um, so this sort of attitude, this disrespecting our husbands, the pushing and the nagging, the complaining, the criticizing, are, are means of destroying our homes really our means, like we just went in and started ripping. Of course, we wouldn't do that. We think we wouldn't do that, but we can do it in our attitude, in our demeanor, in our words. So, rather face harsh weather, rough weather outside. Uh, just go on out. Now, back to my um, friend in the, uh, the commentary. He says that um, she can't govern her tongue or her temper. She's always harping. And she becomes her husband's torment and her own shame. This is, whew, this is heavy stuff. <laughs> you know, I think, oh, Lord, <laughs> am I doing that? You know, am I doing that? Don't think, just because everything seems to be going all right, do a check. I mean, do a check. Is there an area? You may not be like this woman where it's pouring rain on the inside, but is there a little dripping going on anywhere? And if you let it just keep going, what will it be like in a few years? You know, so do this sort of check. Is there an area where I'm just critical and I won't let go of it? And I complain to God about it and I complain to my husband instead of just saying, you know, um, let it go. 
I talked to a woman once who was ready to leave her husband. And when I found out the reason, it was because he wouldn't pick up his socks. And that sounds so trite, but what had happened, and it is trite, but what happened is she had made that such an issue because she'd ask him and ask him and ask him to do it. And so every time they were there on the floor, to her it was saying, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. Know. And um, obviously there were troubles, but it would boil down to socks. Why not just say, you know, um, Lord, sanctify me as I pick up these socks every day. I mean, <laughs> rather that than destroying your home over it. You know, is there some little fussy thing like that? And I can remember a fussy little thing like that and thinking, Lord, help me to pick this up every day as though you left it here. These are your socks. <laughs> what, would, what would our attitude be like then? Why did you do that? No. You know, aren't we to um, submit to our husbands as to the Lord? So that as you render sub submission, as you render respect, you're doing it unto the Lord. You're looking past this man, and you're saying, you know, Lord, I'm doing this unto you. I don't really feel like it right now. It's annoying me. But that, please bless it if I do it by faith, trusting you out of obedience and doing it unto you, as though you're the one that left this mess. Just a few positive verses, okay, before we... Uh, <laughs> about to open it for questions in about five minutes here, so. Well, they're kind of positive. <laughs> <laughs> but here are some qualities we can pull out to apply to ourselves so that we, in our homes, that our homes are these havens, um, wonderful places where, you know, it just spills out. The, the unity, the Christian charity and kindness in our homes spills out so that when we, we have something to export. You know, we want to have people over, not to, not to brag about what we have, no, to share it. It's like if your cupboards are full, well, you want to share it. You want to have people in. But if you don't have anything, if, if the cupboards are bare, you don't have anything um, to share. So we want our homes to be full of comfort, not hostility. But here are a few qualities that characterize a wise woman. Proverbs 3, 7, don't be wise in your own eyes. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Okay, Don't think you've always got it right. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Listen to your husband. What is his perspective on this? Do you allow him to teach you? Are you receptive, approachable? Um, do you ask him to give you input? So don't be wise in your own eyes, but receive it. He who heeds the word wisely will find good, and whoever trusts in the Lord, happy is he. You know, we want to heed the word wisely. Marriage isn't even all about us. It's about glorifying God. It's not about our needs. It's about what's God calling me to do. And in any affliction you have, whether it's related to your marriage or related to any aspect of your life, there's an affliction, there's a trial, your response should be, Lord, help me be a good steward of this. What's my duty in this? You know, my um, having this marriage trouble here, what's my duty as a Christian woman? How can I be a good steward of it? Or uh, when your children's ill, you know, there's a trial of some kind, financial or health or any number of things. Could be you, could be a child, the same thing. How can I be a good steward of this and learn what you want me to learn, obey you the way you want me to obey? Heed the word wisely. The, the wise in heart, this is 10.8, the wise in heart will receive commands, but if a prating fool will fall. The wise woman is teachable, not prickly, approachable. Like, don't bring that up. I don't want to hear this. Don't talk to me. We're teachable, open. Someone brings you a criticism, whether it's your husband or someone else, that you just make it a policy to receive it. Say, well, thank you. Thanks for telling me. I'll think about what you said, and especially if it's from your husband. This is your head. Say, thank you, honey, for bringing that to me. And let me, uh, I'm just, is it all right if I just think about it for a while and I'll get back to you with a response? You know, because maybe your flesh wants to respond right there with the defense. Mm -hmm. Say, well, this is coming from your husband. You know, sometimes when um, you think he's, you can tell it's coming, he's going to bring something to you, ask God to prepare your heart right then so you don't respond in a prickly fashion. 
the wise in heart will receive commands. The prating fool will fall. He who keeps instruction is in the way of life, but he who refuses correction goes astray. So often we're wise in our own eyes. We refuse instruction. We are not approachable about anything. I just think we ought to be more open on all kinds of things. The church can get can draw up sides over things like homeschooling or uh, private Christian education or home birthing or, you know, all these issues that we're on the same team here. And um, we should, if someone comes to you and says, you know, I'm concerned about whatever it is, they may be out of line. I can remember a couple when we were first married came in to see us and told Doug he was in sin because he was studying philosophy. And that that was wicked and you shouldn't do that. And I just remember, you know, I was wanting to say a few things. (laughs) (laughs) But I didn't. (laughs) But he said, thank you very much. You know, I'll pray about what you said and I appreciate it. (gasps) You know, but I've seen him do that repeatedly. I've learned because that's not the way I would do it. You know, I want to write off. I remember doing a, a lecture like this and there was a lady waiting for me and I knew I had this feeling you know, that she had something to say to me, and I was just like, Lord, please give me a receptive heart and not be arrogant and think, I have it all right. You know, I don't. We want to be teachable, correctable, responsive, even if we disagree, but at least to be approachable. And, of course, your husband, um, your pastor, there are certain people that you should be very receptive to. Your parents, they're critical, maybe, of something you're doing, um, Critical of homeschooling or critical of Christian education, whatever it is. Critical of home birth and growth, who knows. But to say, well, thank you, Mom, for sharing that with me. You know, I'll, I'll pass your concerns on to my husband, and, um, you know, we love you very much, and we'll take what you say very seriously, and we'll think about it. Now, you may differ. You may differ after you pray about it, but do you see the attitude? Particularly towards your husband. This is a wise woman. This is a respectful demeanor. So that if your husband has anything on any level to tell you about, that you listen, you receive it. In the multitude of sins, excuse me, in the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is wise. This is the same principle here. Just don't react. Think about it. Pray about it. Now, just to wrap up quickly, there are tremendous effects of obedience in these areas. And women, I think we really underestimate the potency of what we do. We underestimate the impact we can have on our husbands, our families, our church, our community. It just works its way out. We really underestimate the, what, the good thing God has given us to do in our homes. I know I didn't really have time to spend a lot on the domestic part of being home. Um, but there's such potential for a huge impact. And of course, it starts with us. It's a blessing. Like I just read in Proverbs, he who uh, heeds the word is wise, and the, uh, let's see, there's promises of, of health, of happiness, and so forth when we obey God's word. We, we're blessed, aren't we? Aren't you blessed when you obey? You feel sick when you're sinful until you get it right with God? Proverbs 31, 25, strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in the time to come. She's a crown. So first of all, it's a great impact on you when you live this way in a respectful, uh, God-honoring way. You're a crown of blessing. You're building. You're constructing. You're having an impact for good. You're strong. You're a source of strength to others. You have something to export, something to give. Of course, you're a blessing to your husband. He's a, he receives a lot of benefits from your obedience because you're doing him good and not evil all the days of your life, and he trusts you. His heart trusts you safely. He doesn't trust you dangerously, knowing, well, I'm trusting her, but I'm scared. She's, you know. No, he can trust you safely. And I think it's, it causes him to receive more respect from other people when he has a respectful wife. It's amazing the impact it has. It's a blessing to children, tremendous blessing to them, to live in a home where dad is respected, mom is loved, where there is mutual submission and kindness and courtesy extended all directions, where mom's happy, dad's respected. You know, kids are secure 
and flourish in that kind of an atmosphere. And then, of course, families like this are a great blessing to the church, aren't they? Just think of a church full of families like this. It's, it's tremendous. Um, Proverbs calls the mouth of the righteous a well of life. It feeds many. So there's a lot of um, building one another up. And we all need it. We all need it, don't we? Uh, my husband, who's feeding the sheep, he needs to be fed. He needs to be fed, too. He needs to be built up and encouraged. We all do. So a woman like this, and I think a whole church of women like this, tremendous impact on the church and then on the community. Again, it just spills out. But it has to start with us. It has to start in our homes and work its way out. We can't expect the community to be different or the church to be different until we are different and our homes are different. So we want to be known, of course, in the community as a holy people. They're weird. They're weird people. They, they love each other. They celebrate together. This wonderful community. What are they doing? We don't get it. But it starts in your marriages first, in yourself first, in your marriage and, and onward. And remember, it is all by faith. Many times you may not see that this is going to, I don't see what good this is going to do. But I believe God's word. I'm going to do it because God says it. I'm going to respect my husband in this, even though I disagree. I'm going to um, keep my mouth shut by faith, trusting the Lord. Now, I want to give you an opportunity for questions, if you have any. And I'll repeat the question so it will be on this little tape. Anybody have a question? Okay. Okay. Okay, there's good question. The question is what if it involves your children's safety? Right? What if um, your husband's comfortable with the kids playing down the street and you haven't met the family and you're uncomfortable? Okay, that's a good question. There'll be things like that. Well, I would say um, you could say something like, let's say they just called and daughter comes in and asks. Um, you could say, honey, can I just talk to you for a minute first? And then just share your concerns. Say, would you mind if we um, got to know them first? And, you know, would you give us a little more time on this one? And if he says, no, 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 this is great, then, then just say, okay. Trust the Lord. Now, if it was something ridiculous, you know, like jumping off a bridge or something, life-threatening, you know, of course that's different. But on a wisdom issue like this, it may be that, that the, your child will come home and say, whoa, that was really something. And then your husband will see that you actually, you had good input. But you don't want to say, see, honey? <laughs> that's a temptation. But you, if you have a, a respectful spirit, say, you know, that's, that is what I was concerned about. And your husband, if you have a respectful demeanor, he might say, I am sorry, you were right. But if, if you're tooting your own horn, then he probably won't say, I'm sorry, you're right, or it'll be harder for him. Okay? But on things like that, I would ask for time. Say, honey, could we just pray about this a little more, or could we have them over first, or would you consider, would you reconsider? Some issues are so big. You know, I think of Esther. She spread out a feast, several feasts, before she laid out her concern. <laughs> you have to time it right. Sometimes it's happening right now. And so you have to do it now. But there are other times you may have something to bring. You just want to time it right and pray for good opening. Um, have you given them a good dinner? <laughs> and I'm not talking about manipulation, but I am talking about, you know, we're just flesh and, flesh and blood. I mean, you know, we're just creatures. And so don't time it wrong. He's tired. He just got home from work. He's got a headache. He's been in traffic for an hour and a half. You know, it's not a good time to just spring something on him. There was another question somewhere. Right. Um, I'm sure there's probably plenty of opportunities where, even where the wife might think this is good to talk about in a counseling group with another woman, the husband still wouldn't approve. Right. What, can you give some examples of those? Okay. 
question is, can I give some examples of topics that would be suitable to bring up and topics that wouldn't? I think I, OK. And as far as getting counsel, well, I remember when we were first married, Doug's parents are godly Christian people who had taught me a lot as a new Christian on relationships and family. And of course, he'd grown up there and learned lots from them. So I can remember in the early days, once in a while, I'd think, I need to talk to somebody about this. Say, Doug, do you mind if I ask your mom? Sometimes he would say, sure, go ahead. That's a good idea. Other times he might say, no, we can work this out. We have our Bible. We can, we can do it. You don't need to ask her. So that's great because I know he is trying to work it out. But I, we decided when we were first married, we would only get counsel as a couple agreeing that we wouldn't go behind one another's backs to get counsel. I'd say, there, of course, there are exceptions. Um, if you think your husband's being unfaithful and you have good reason to think this, and you need, you need some help. But I would recommend you get pastoral help. That's why so often people will come to us with big situations, and, uh, and maybe I could just get a phone call from somebody I don't know, and I'll say, you need pastoral counsel. They say, well, we don't have a church. Think, oh, you know, that's really tough. Or um, we're not members of a church, so they can't exercise discipline if my husband's seeing someone else or, you know, they put themselves out of any possible accountability. So I say use God's appointed means. It may be that um, with little nickel dime things, you say, honey, do you mind if I talk to my friend about X, Y, or Z? And he may say, great, that's a good idea. I mean, there are plenty of things like that. But if it's something, if it's uh, sexual matters or maybe it's financial matters or just things that are um, more private, he may say, well, look, let's go together, or let me think about it, or um, let's try this first, see if we can do it first, let's read a book together. You know, there are lots of different ways, but if you ask, he knows this is an issue you're dealing with and you're wanting help. And I've been surprised at the um, times that men have said, sure, go talk to Nancy. I think, wow, that's great. One time a woman called me, told me about she really wanted counsel, and I, and I knew her, and I knew her husband, they'd moved away. And I said, well, does he know you're calling me? She said, no. I said, well, would you just ask him? Just say, do you mind if I call Nancy? So she called me back, and she said, he said no. And I said, well, then honor God. Trust the Lord and submit to your husband. He'll bless that. And he did, because he saw she wants help, and he saw she's being respectful and asking me. And so they went to their church and got counsel there and got things worked out. So that's, I think that's the best way to go when you can. So, and when I talk about sex the next hour, I'll bring up some things in that area. Okay? Does that answer your question right? I think we need to close. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to this week's edition of the All of Christ for All of Life podcast. That was a message from our audio collection titled Reforming Marriage Conference. If you'd like to hear the rest of the talks, you can purchase them at canonpress.com.